on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We talk some OU with Mims, Gray, and Willis on watch lists, and Kyler Murray got paid. Then Casey Smith from Barstool Sports joins us for a very fun interview, and we finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hosty, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, July 25th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there's so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And the Beats and Bites Festival is rolling, people. Scotty McCreary up next on July 30th. It's $5 general admission and kids under 12 get in free. There will be all kinds of things for the kiddos to do, including face painting and an inflatable obstacle course. And don't forget about all the food trucks. To buy tickets, visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this Sunday night, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. How we doing, Ted? Fantastic. Cannot complain. Great weekend. All is well. I had my wife's family reunion at Grand Lake this weekend. Ah. Whew. Yeah. Many beverages consumed. Getting it in, huh? That's many, good. many beverages consumed. But feeling hey, feeling pretty good, all things considered. Okay, this is gonna be a fun episode. Obviously, gonna talk a lot of OU football. And we've got, I don't know if she's enemy number one right now of OU Twitter, <laughs> but she just might be. Casey Smith's going to join us from Barstool Sports. So that is, that's going to be fun. Yes. Um, very interesting. She's, uh, she knows how to rile them up. It's not hard right now. It's pretty easy to rile up the fan base, but she definitely knows how to touch a chord for sure. Yeah, there's no doubt. All right, let's get into the OU stuff. And watch list season continues to roll. And Marvin Mims was named to the Belitnikoff Award watch list. And when you think about his year last year, right? And, you know, I, I was thinking about it and clearly Lincoln leaving and all the, all the change. And he was thinking about what he wanted to do, stay or go. But the fact that Lebby was bringing that offense and, you know, just what Venables is all about. He's talked about how it was an easy decision to stay but man i i had kind of forgotten only 32 catches last year yeah which in a couple of games it just felt like he almost disappeared it's just weird 32 catches 705 yards five touchdowns ted i don't know if he's gonna have a bolitnikoff worthy year but i expect those numbers to to significantly increase yeah i do too um I, it, it it sounds like he's done all the right things. The one thing I don't know is uh, that's a, that's a talented group, man. That's a talented group right now. And there's some bigger guys in the room. Now uh, it's a different offense. You know, you've got a different quarterback that you've got to develop some chemistry with. I mean, I don't think obviously like he's going to get outshined by anyone, but, I just, I, it's hard to really forecast if this offense is going to have a go-to guy, you know what right. I'm saying? It, with as many different styles of player they have, is there going to be a go-to weapon? Well, it's not even, and that's not even wide receiver, right? Running back as well. Lebby yeah. traditionally has liked to get a lot of different guys touches. And I, I think it has a lot to do with, with making it challenging on the defense, but also the more I get to know Levy, the more I hear about Levy, he understands what college kids are like. He understands that if you get 
certain guys touches early in the game, like it can raise their level of play because it changes their demeanor and just, you know, how, how invested they feel in the game. Like that is, there's still a very real human component to this sport. And he understands that. So he, he likes to spread the ball around, especially early, but one of his things is score from far. Right. So I would expect Mims, and and I know the offense is all about matchups, but I would expect Mims to really be trying to test teams vertically this year. I mean, now there's a lot that goes into that. You got to run the ball well to set up those chances. You got to protect the quarterback well, like the offensive line's got to be playing well. You got to do a lot of things well to really have a strong vertical passing game. But Mims can absolutely run, man. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt about it. So I'm really hoping that we see more of those explosive plays in the vertical passing game for him because I'm thinking this offense plays to his strengths a little better. Yeah. I I think, you know, I think one of the reasons Mims numbers struggled a little bit last year is because the running game struggled, right? You know, and, and, Sometimes that seems counterintuitive, but the better you run the football, the better you throw the football. And I feel like the run game is going to be amped up quite a bit this year. And, you know, with some of those, those looks that you force and some of the play action stuff, it's going to, it's going to give these guys some really good matchups. It's just the question, is that guy going to be Mims? And right now you got to say he's the leader of the group, but there's some other dudes now. There's there's a lot of guys. The the name that keeps coming up is Julio Farouk. Yeah. Right? That and he's having he's having a tremendous summer. But that's the name that keeps coming up. But when you talk to the guys on the staff, uh, when you talk to the guys on the strength staff that he is he has been building in the offseason for the fall and they think it can be a breakout season for him. But I, I'm not – I'm excited about Farouk, but I'm, I'm going back to this sense of almost frustration I have felt from Marvin Mims all offseason. Uh, frustration a, – a, a motivated frustration, if you will, where I think he, he wants to remind people of, you know, what type of player he can be. And clearly – Dylan Gabriel's got to play at a high level. A lot of things have to happen for Marvin Mims to have a massive year, but I I think he is, I think he's going to have a big year. I really do. Now, Bolitnikoff award level. I tough. That's tough. That's tough, but I don't think there's any doubt. He's got a chip on his shoulder. There's no doubt in my mind. Well, he should. It's almost like it's been a, uh, you didn't even have to really do anything if you transferred away from Oklahoma it elevated you as a player right uh, Hazelwood transfers away and now all of a sudden it's like he left and wow how is OU going to survive without a five-star wide receiver Mario Williams transfers to USC and it's like wow Mario Williams to USC amazing and Mims got to be sitting there like hang on a second now let's just hang on two seconds this uh, this thing is not going to end up the way people think it is. It, it he's probably frustrated that everyone that he's outdone the last couple of years is getting all these accolades for leaving, and no one's talking about him. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. It's like, oh yeah, Hazelwood's going to be incredible at Arkansas. Mario Williams, he's going to just tear through the Pac-12. Those guys weren't even close to productive as Mims, like right. not even close. In fact, both of those guys were very disappointing last season yeah. from a production standpoint. So yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it for sure. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's gotta be frustrating for him, uh, but it'll again, come. it's not going to last long before he, it starts pouring in. Yeah. So Eric gray is on the Doak Walker ward watch list. And he felt underutilized last year, right? Uh, and he's certainly the guy that 
the staff trusts the most in the running back room, but the, I, I think the running game schematic changes are going to be very beneficial to him. I mean, he even talked to me about it last year, how it was hard for him to adjust to the tempo of the GT counter stuff, especially the way that Kennedy Brooks would do it. He did, I don't think that was very natural for him. Now, I think he settled into it a little bit, but he never looked totally comfortable running that way. I, I think when you look at Levy's kind of mid-zone scheme and how much of that stuff they're going to do, I think that's going to allow him to be a little more aggressive with his style, a, a little more assertive run, a little more, you know, with a little more physicality. And he had several runs. We talked about it on here a lot last year where it felt like, oh, he just One like yep. just Shoe got it by the shoestrings. Like and it just hopefully those turn into big, long, explosive runs this year. And, and I do think going to a heavier zone running attack will be will be really beneficial for Eric Gray. But now as far as winning the award for being the best running back in the country, he, he's going to have to show us a lot more than that, but it's cool that he's on the watch list. Yeah, well, I, I think he's, he's got a lot of skills. Uh, this offense is one where you can put up some good numbers as a running back. You know, there's some things to watch for that, you know, frankly, weren't there before throwing the ball to the running backs for whatever reason, not something that Lincoln Riley liked to do. They did it with Mixon, but even with Mixon, it was almost like they had to split him out to ever throw him the football. There was some, like he caught some wheel routes and stuff like that, or some, uh, you know, some seam balls up the middle whenever they, they schemed something up. But well, I started laughing during the spring game. We threw the check down. They threw the check down a couple of times in the spring game, which, you know, may not seem like a whole lot, but, you know, you dump it down to a running back on, you know, it's third and 10, you dump it down on a little five yard check down, let a guy like him get some space, make a backer miss and go get a first down. You know, those, those plays can turn out to be incredibly productive running back screens. We didn't throw hardly any running back screens. It was always, you know, some type of schemed up wide receiver screen or something like that. So I think there's some different avenues for him to make some plays. But again, just kind of like Mims, there's some other dudes there that have you wondering what their production is going to look like. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about that, but it, it kind of goes back to now I had a conversation with Deuce Vaughn during the season last year because it seemed like they always found two or three times a game to where they just got him one-on-one -on -one with a backer on an angle route. Like that, that was exact. It's one of the hardest things for a linebacker to do is cover an angle route. And, but they would figure out certain, certain formations, use certain motions to where they knew they were going to get that matchup. And Levy likes to do that type of stuff as well. And I do think Eric Gray, he, and he showed flashes of, remember, you know, Caught it well out of the backfield against Oregon. He he's shown flashes of being really, really capable of making big plays if you can put him in those situations. So it'll be interesting to see if he gets some more of that stuff. But yeah, it's it's gonna be tough to be, you know, just the the dominant force in the backfield when it comes to how the the carries are going to get distributed because Levy likes to get a lot of guys involved. And Marcus Major seems like he's really good for this scheme. Javante Barnes has already added more strength, speed, weight this summer. So e Eric Gray, while he is the he's the guy the staff to trust the most, that they trust the most, he's the veteran guy. He's also, you know, I mean, you've got to perform, right? I mean, you absolutely have to perform or else – some of these other guys are going to get chances. Now they're going to get chances anyways, but I, I expect him to, I expect him to be a lot more productive. I do. I think this style fits him better. Yeah. Well, you can't win that award without a really good offensive line. And, you know, this, um, this is going to be the biggest test of the thing that I'm, I'm going to be watching the most through training camp and, 
in early season, what does this offensive line look like? Are they gelling? Does, does the, does the scheme fit these guys? Are they playing as one? If you get some good play from those guys early, you can start talking about, you know, players going out there and, and putting together, you know, big seasons. I mean, you, first thing you got to do is, is be first team all conference. It's been a while since we've had a first team all conference running back, you know, just that's, that's a uh, goal number one right there. Yeah. No, I hear you. Okay. Last guy on another watch list, Braden Willis, your guy, Braden Willis on the Mackey award watch list. Of course, the Mackey award goes to the best tight end in the country. And listen, I love Braden Willis. I love all the dirty work he does. I still continue to wonder what is a realistic expectation for him when it comes to like the jump in production as a pass catcher this year. He's an athletic freak. There's no doubt about it. But he's also an athletic freak that had 15 catches last year for 177 yards. He has, he has not been a big factor in the past game ever in his OU career, in his four years. What, what are we expecting from him? Like, he, he's been that guy that does all the little things from him, tight end, H-back, fullback, whatever you want to call it. But is it realistic to expect him to have some breakout year as a pass catcher? No. I, I don't think it's bad to expect that. Expect him to go in the Mackey, that may be a bit much. But I, I think I think it's definitely within reason that, you know, he can be a a, a 35, 40 catch tight end. I, right. I don't think that 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 is – which, um, which would be a massive increase in production. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know. You know, we saw that red zone target against Oklahoma State, which is like, this is what we've been asking for, right, with Braden Willis. It, with You know, he's long. He's athletic. Uh, you know, you give him a mismatch, he can go up and make some plays for you. I, I don't know how much of stuff like that I would expect. But, man, when you're a big zone team, you're going to be a big boot team. And when you're a big boot team, the easiest throws are always the tight end. You try and look for the comeback. It's not there. You look for the over. It's not there. You look for the flat, you know, and there's, I, I imagine they're going to run a lot of boot off of all the zone looks that they do. And, you know, that should give him the ability to have a, a higher catch total. Does it mean that he's going to have a Mark Andrews type of 2017 year? No, I don't think so. It's going to be a little bit different style, but he can still be way more productive. Yeah. So Mark Andrews, when he won the Mackey in 2017, 62 catches, 958 yards, eight touchdowns. If Braden Willis has half of that, this offense is going to be really, really good. Yeah. I, agree. I mean, if he is, if he's a guy that has 400 to 500 yards receiving, that would be huge. For this offense, it would just add a weapon that they haven't had right in the passing game, just a big athletic guy. And I know it's weird saying that because Braden Willis has been on the team, but he hasn't, he hasn't been that guy up to this point. That's one of the most intriguing storylines heading into this season for me is now can he stay healthy, right? That's, that's also been an issue for him. But if all of a sudden a guy that big and athletic is a big factor in your passing game that changes that changes how defense defenses have to view things. So that would be huge. I just, I just don't know what to expect, man. I really don't. Yeah, It's hard to know. Here's another thing that I think helps him out a lot. I don't know how much 12 personnel two tight end stuff. Levy's going to do. I imagine it's going to be a decent amount and he's no longer the thumper blocker. That's Parker. Right? He's the big, strong ox. So that puts him in the position where he'd be the guy that maybe moves a little bit more behind the line of scrimmage. He's the guy that maybe whenever you go 12 personnel splits out uh, and is away from the core. So I think that possibly could help out his production numbers as well. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's no longer a Y. He's an F. Yeah. Yep. He's the, 
he's the athletic one. That's it's um, which he was before too, but you know, they just, they just had a, a different role for him. Yeah, no, I, uh, I hear you. I, I think that's going to be fascinating. All right. One more. OU thing. Kyler Murray's rich. <laughs> he, yes, is. he is. I, I figured we, yeah, I figured we'd talk about this here. And remember, he made it abundantly clear he wanted a new contract, right? Did the whole social media thing, scrubbed the Instagram, right? Uh, agent putting out public statements and made it very clear. Wanted a contract extension, uh, did everything he felt was necessary. And well, Teddy got what he wanted because Kyler and the Arizona Cardinals have agreed to a five-year extension worth $230.5 million, which includes $160 million guaranteed. Not too shabby for the guy that some people thought should go play baseball. Man. That's so much I money. wish it was that easy. Uh, if I just scrubbed my social media account, Everyone would just like forget I existed. It would I, I wouldn't find myself with forty six million dollars a year. It, you know? it would it wouldn't lead to one hundred and sixty million guaranteed. <laughs> no, if you no. started taking some of your radio stuff off your Twitter, it wouldn't lead to anything. It'd lead <laughs> to nothing. Absolutely nothing. Oh, it's amazing. Well worth it. Well played by him. Hey, um, you know, whenever you're you're as good as he is, you're as athletic as he is. You can do the things that he can do. I mean, they're not going to find another guy like that. It's way too risky to start, you know, going back through the draft or try and find a trade avenue. It's That's the going rate. I mean, whether you think players are worth it or not, I mean, we've been watching this in NBA basketball. I, it's just the going rate. It's just what you have to pay to have one of those guys on your team. And, you know, we're going to continue to – like with Kyler Murray, I, it's not one of those things. It's like, what, but you're going to see those contracts and they're going to keep coming up. And you're going to be saying how in the world, why in the world are they paying that guy? That money It's just, he, you don't have another option. Yeah, no, I hear you. And what only Aaron Rodgers will be making more money than him. You know, when you look on the average annual salary stuff until that next crop of quarterbacks negotiates their extensions, but <laughs> When it came out, all I could think about is, when is this going to be on a USC recruiting pamphlet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a race to see who can take uh, take advantage of it first, right? Right. And uh, who, I, I will say, hey, the, yeah. w- when former players sign contracts like this, it, it's a huge weapon for OU, right? That is that's clearly life changing money. It's it's incredible. And it, it allows Brent Venables and his staff to use that on the recruiting trail. Now, of course, Lincoln Riley coached Kyler Murray. He's going to use it as well. Like, there's no doubt about it. But this is, this is a guy that's about to get a Heisman statue. He just got this contract. And remember, there's going to be a big event where a bunch of guys come back for that Heisman statue dedication, just like we saw with, with Baker Mayfield. That's going to turn into a huge recruiting weekend. So it's just, I, I just, when I see stuff like this, it may be bad. Like I'm happy for Kyler clearly, but I'm also like, excellent. Oh, you gets to use this to get good players. No, it's good. It's, it, you know, we've seen a lot of this stuff. They've, they've talked about like Trent Williams, you know, some of his things that he's had going on, some different guys out there. And you see all the different graphics that go out continuously from the football, Twitter account, social media accounts. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Whether you had anything to do with it or not, you know, you've got to, you've got to go ahead and latch onto it and use it for what you can. Oh, absolutely. And I will say Cardinals, you know, it seems like they've gotten a little better each year with Kyler as their quarterback. Now he's got the contract. Now he needs to play all 17 games. Now he needs to go win in the playoffs, right? You're good for life. You're good. Now it's time. Now it's time to go show just how good you are as a player because you don't have to worry about money anymore nope so I, i'm DeAndre excited hopkins still is he still serving is does he have games he has to miss this coming up coming season or is he done with that oh man i forgot about that yeah 
No, it's to it's to start the year, right? Is it to start the year? Yeah. Six games? I think so. We could be completely wrong. Cause didn't they draft someone? Remember, that was the whole deal. We yeah. we we need to remember this. What happened? There was something that happened that in hindsight we all were like, oh, they knew Hopkins was gonna get suspended. That's why. Oh, they traded for Hollywood. Jesus, that's what it was. Yeah, that's right. God, I I was about to Google it, and I'm glad I remembered. That's going to be great. Uh, yeah, I that division is brutal, but they they've got some weapons now. Their offense is going to be going to be big time. Yeah it it really will be interesting to see if he. I don't know if he just looks like he's having more fun. Now that he's, <laughs> how can you not? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Pressure's you know? off. Go play, baby. Yeah. All right. For call your shot, we've got questions that you guys sent in in our interview with Casey Smith. But of course, we're doing birthday shout outs, people. Come on. Happy third birthday to Hensley Don Bookman. Happy sixth birthday to Will Crutchfield. Happy ninth birthday to Kobe Jace Worley. Happy 15th birthday. To Brody Bourgeois? Ooh. What is that? That Bourgeois? 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 That, that's French for sure. Brody Bourgeois? I don't know. You've got me Burgess? on that one. Happy Burgios? birthday, Brody. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bourgeois. I don't know what that is. That's probably so wrong. Happy 26th birthday to Spencer Belcastro. Happy 31st birthday to Morgan Priest. Happy 33rd birthday to Aaron Patillo. Yeah, yeah. Happy Two 35th. L's make a Y. Yeah, that's right. Happy 35th birthday to Fatima. I think I spelled it wrong. I think that's supposed to be Ramiro. <laughs> happy, birth- happy 35th birthday to Fatima Ramiro. All the way out in Madrid, Spain. Uh, nice happy 38th birthday to molly butler happy 44th birthday to brandon big dog hubbard happy birthday to taylor rusky happy 15th anniversary to ou superfans pat and jennifer brown still f- was is this me still feel bad about the best man speech but i'd say it worked out that's that that's going to get a good laugh from them. I don't know what okay. it means, but <laughs> Pat and Jennifer are going to enjoy that. I and thought I, that was a uh, statement that you put in there. So I was like, oh, is Gabe supposed to read that? I did not. I did not put that one in there. Uh, I've also got happy 25th anniversary to Dave Grogan from Mish. Nice. Okay. All right. Let's get to our interview with Casey Smith from Barstool Sports. But first. The only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. Love's has over 600 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Love's also has you covered if you get your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Loves Travel Stops. For a full list, list of what Loves has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life, in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. Still get a discount on all the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. With a 12-to-1 student-to-teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. 
If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Remember, financial aid is available. All right, here she is. Here's Casey Smith. It is our pleasure to be joined by the co-host of the Unnecessary Roughness podcast. She's the host of the Barstool College Football Show and the host of the Pro Football Football Show that she does with some guy named Deion Sanders. Casey Smith is in the house. Casey, what's going on? I am just happy to be here, guys. I, you know, Gabe, we were talking before we started recording that, you know, it feels like football should already be here. And basically the way I've been treating Twitter for the last couple of weeks, especially with your fans, is that it is football season. So I'm just happy to actually be talking this out tonight. I just, <laughs> once football starts, we can put all this behind us, right? Is, is that right. what happens? Like, <laughs> We can start complaining about how bad our teams are and, and what coaches suck. Like we can put everything behind us once we kick the ball off. Yeah, talking season, is, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We just talk at each other, sometimes yell, scream. It depends on what side you're on. But once the ball actually gets kicked off at the end of August, early September, all this goes behind us, and then we rinse and repeat until we die. So here we are, fellas. So, so until the games actually start getting played, we, we've all been doing a lot of talking. and. You have, you have, you've pissed off the OU fan base or at least OU Twitter. I have. Yes. What happened? What did you do? Uh, well, God, do you, how long do you have? Let me, we, let me, I, I mean, we control this. <laughs> it can be as long as you want it to be. Yeah. Well, what's funny is, and, and just to give you guys a little bit of history, and I don't know how long, you know, you've been watching Barstool or, or, you know, I mean, obviously at this point, it's like, I feel like nobody watches and everybody watches, but so I've been doing this since 2018. So this is my fifth year uh, with, with Barstool with college football. And in fact, it's a joke around the office that I am somehow a bandwagon OU fan because every year, I mean, especially with AM, you know, I graduated from there in 2012, but every year I'm always throughout the regular season, I will put that caveat on the regular season. I always think OU is the best in the big 12 and Dave Portnoy and I in 2018 got into this massive blowout fight because every week I would pick OU. And then of course in the playoff, usually what happens in the playoff with all due respect. And he was like, wow, you were wrong about OU. I was like, I actually wasn't. So the weird thing about what's going on with OU fan base right now, and I totally get that people don't pay attention all the time, is that I've been the most OU person in the office other than the people who actually went to OU for the last few years. And then I just happened to bring up this guy named Lincoln Riley, and I kept bringing him up because it kept working. And now all of my good graces for the past four to five years are just out the window. So, They're out the window. Well, what, what, what is, what's like the crux of the issue? What's the... What's what's the exact take that has everyone so heated right now? So first of all, and like I, you know, I said this last year when this happened, I know it's right around the year anniversary is that, you know, Lincoln Riley surprised everybody. I mean, I know you guys are much more inside the program and, you know, being former players, you can maybe hear rumors from what I understand from everybody that I've talked to, this literally came out of nowhere. So it was a shock. Now, if I'm an OU fan, I'm like, you know, what the hell's going on? The crux with what's going on right now is if I bring up the Pac-12, if I bring up USC, if I bring up Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams, anything to do with that team, even if I don't bring up OU, it's not USC fans in my mentions, it's not UCLA, it's not Oregon, Utah, it's not, you know, somebody in the Big Ten or the SEC, it's always OU fans. And for a while, I totally understood it. It's like, well, yeah, if you get dumped out of nowhere, seemingly just because he wanted to go out West, sure, but now we're almost a year away, Hey guys, if I don't bring up OU, maybe don't talk about it. So that was kind of the way that it started. And what really got it going this past week was we did, you know, how everybody's doing the tiers now and everybody likes to, you know, it's not normally like who's best, who's good, who's great. It's all making fun of different things. And I just said teams that have been there before, but that won't be there again in 2022, 2023. And I put OU there. Now I also may have happened to put USC in my way too early Four for the college football playoff. Oh God, Casey. Now listen. <laughs> oh no. Now, oh no. Understandably, a hot take. However, you know, and, and not to go down that whole rabbit hole, but we've, you know, we've broken apart the conferences, and I'm very high on USC in the Pac-12 just because of what the Pac-12 looks like. That's another conversation. But OU fans didn't care where their logo was; they cared about that USC logo. So I just continued to bait it and said, "Well." you know, why are you guys crying about a coach that's no longer there? And they didn't like that so much. And so then the ball started rolling. And like I said, here we are. 
and then you started defending yourself a little bit and yes what this is probably this is probably a risky question it's all right go for it what was what was the weirdest thing an OU fan said to you oh boy okay so most of the time and I know you guys understand this too like if you're I, by the way weird- I am never tagging you in a tweet <laughs> ever again there's some weird replies man it is it's a whole different world like i wish that sometimes people could just swim through our dms and our mentions because you know we get to say whatever we want whenever we want that's kind of the cool part for me at least being at barstool is that you know we're not censored we don't have to to make people happy and on the flip side that means people can speak to us that way now the problem is is that there is no censor. So if you get a weirdo really going, you get a, re- a weirdo really going. I would say that, and this is per usual, and I'm sure you guys saw it in some of the stuff, the, the sexist arguments back and forth that two men usually get in is always very entertaining to me. Because I, you know, every once in a while, I'll Heisenberg it from Breaking Bad. I'll like to like throw a little bit of the, you know, like throw a little potion in there and see what happens. But normally it's, you know, in one ear, out the other, I'm not even reading it. It's when two, like, a seemingly, you know, I could be catfish, but seemingly full grown ass men arguing about what sexism and misogyny is. That's the weirdest thing in the world to me. It's like, guys, why are you arguing about this for days? I'm not even involved in this. So those, and then of course, usually the ones that tell me to like, you know, go die or kill myself. But I just laugh at those because those people aren't real. Like, come on guys, are we serious? But uh, no, the OU fans had the whole array from one side of the spectrum to the other this week. And it you know, I like to mix it up sometimes. Sometimes I don't, but I, I couldn't help myself with this one. So what's the, with OU, um, and I, I don't know the tier thing, if that's like just not picking them to make the college football playoff, that's not like that you're really down on a school, right? There's, right. there's four teams that make it, but um, why, why do you think Oklahoma, if you do, maybe you don't, is, is going to take a step back? Well, let me tell you a secret, and this is something that I don't think, and I know we're just talking about a a small minority on Twitter and probably a very loud minority. I actually think OU is going to be pretty good. That's the very funny thing about this is that, you know, I do think they are going to take a step back, which normally happens whenever you do have a rebuilding process and not just having your coach leave, having a very successful coach leave, but with the transfer portal and with guys going to the NFL and just a whole new system around them. I mean, that's just natural for anybody, not just Oklahoma. But I don't think Oklahoma is going to take this massive step back. I think Brent Venables is, I mean, as we've seen, he's one of the best coordinators in the country. He's familiar with OU. He was there for a long time and was successful there. But for some reason, when you bring up USC, at least in my experience, this could be completely wrong. That to OU fans means I think OU is going to suck and USC is going to be so much better. For USC, I think they're going to be so much better. Does that mean I think they're going to be better than OU? I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, But I don't hate the team at all. That's what's even funnier about this whole thing. In fact, I think it's a cool opportunity for OU to get ready going into the SEC and however many years that's going to be. But in reality, no matter who you are, you're going to take a step back if you lose the majority of of your big key pieces like OU did. Uh, how how much of it do you think, you know, when you, when you get the backlash you're getting right now, how much of it do you think has to do with you being an Aggie? Oh, uh, th- there's got to be uh, the Texas A&M Association isn't helping anything. Casey. <laughs> you know what? And, you know, I, I, I think I was going to games at Kyle Field literally in the womb. It's the only place I applied to. I've been bleeding maroon my whole life, but it really does me a lot of disservice when it comes to this. And I could admit that because, you know, A&M, I love with all my heart. We haven't won anything since, you know, a conference championship since 1998. I was nine years old, obviously not a national championship since the 30s. So that never plays in my favor, but I'm self-aware with that. The problem is, and again, God bless every fan base. We're all delusional. We're all just absolute crazy people. Aggies as a whole don't like to admit that. So when people who don't know what I do for a living or don't know that I cover the sport nationally, go to my Twitter bio or Instagram or whatever and see Aggie there, boy, I mean, I'm fighting uphill immediately. It's like me, I'm King Leonidas in 300, trying to just fight off a whole bunch of people saying like, no, no, I know A&M has sucked for a long time. That's not my argument here. I didn't bring up A&M, you did. Uh, but it comes with the territory. And like, I, I wouldn't trade anything. I would trade a couple of national titles. I'd like that. But I love being an Aggie, but it does not help me in these arguments, fellas. It's it's a tough one to, to swallow sometimes. Well, is this is this the year? Are, are, are they going to back you up any of this this season coming up? 
Teddy, I hope so. Boy, I hope so. This is, you know, this is the type of year where, and I think, you know, and, and again, I think Brandon Walker, my co-host friend, Nessie Repna says it perfectly. Like hope is the most valuable currency for any college football fan and any fan base, no matter how bad you were the season before. The issue with AM is they have, we have everything stacked up. You've got a coach now, granted, he won a national title at Florida State, still has won one. The number one overall recruiting class, more money than God knows what to do with. It just doesn't translate to the field. And the expectations that are on AM, if they continue to stay this high and nothing happens, I mean, yeah, that, that, I don't know, you can't even defend that. And I think that's where my self-awareness living in New York and having to deal with the whole country comes in. It's like, how can I defend having everything you could possibly need to be a successful program and it not translating to the field? But boy, having that number one overall recruiting class, and I'm not usually a big person in recruiting, but I have to be, if you have the number one, you have to brag about that and not translating, that's going to suck. And I don't know what's going to happen. I choose to believe that it's not, but a &M has to put up or shut up right now. And boy, I hope that it, it helps. It works because we need that badly. They, you, you mentioned the recruiting class, right? Historically good. The best ever, Always. right? <laughs> the best ever. Yes. Yes. And then you had the Saban and Jimbo thing, mm -hmm. right? Saban talking about A&M buying players. Like as an A&M fan, how, how did you feel about Saban saying that? Because clearly Jimbo was pissed. Yeah, so this is, I get myself, you, you want to think about getting yourself in trouble with your own fan base, which I'm sure both of you have probably dealt with in the past too. This is one of those that Aggie fans don't like me saying out loud, but it's the truth. To me, especially now with the NIL deals, it's like, I don't care how much money it takes to put the best guys on the field for the best team. If that means they're going to win, that means that they're going to win. And now that you can get around, which I've always been a fan of, of the NIL idea that just that you can make your money off, at least your name. You know, I know paying players is a snowball thing and you can't really ever figure out how to do that. But now that it's legal to do, and we don't have, you know, Jeremy Pruitt's wife handing off bags and nail salons, like now that <laughs> McDonald's bags, you don't have to do like, you can just hand it over like pay however much you want. And I mean, A&M is, you know, a school just like Oklahoma, just like a lot of these big time state programs that have just unlimited funds to do stuff. And these boosters and these don't, you know, these donors that just want to pay. So when Nick Saban comes out and I, first of all, I think, you know, what he said was not that big of a deal. I know that, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, like taking it back. It's like, well, yeah, A&M had the number one over overall recruiting class in the first year NIL deals are legal. What do you think they're doing? When Jimbo originally came back to him, I loved it because not it could have been any coach on the planet. Somebody's going back at Nick Saban and saying what so many people want to in the time. I loved it. It was like they didn't bow down to Goliath and say, okay, you know, it's Coach Saban. We're going to let him say whatever. Jimbo came out and said, you know, hey, no, 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 that's not how this is going to work. What I hated was the walk back at SEC Media Days, the kissing and making up, like, get out of here. What was, what was that? I hated it. I hated it. And I know you have to like, again, I I've been to a million SEC media days, you know, when I was with ESPN and the SEC network and I had to go in and dress cute and wear my high heels and listen to all the coach speak and say, okay, coach, that was great. Congratulations. Now I'm like, no, 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 no. Say what you mean. And so when he got up there, I couldn't have hated it more. Like the team is always going to, they're always going to get up for that game. Obviously it's a big game in the SEC West this year, hopefully a big game nationally um, by the time that they play on October 8th. But as fans, I wanted that hate. I don't want to see coaches kissing and making up. And so, you know, I don't know what the thought process was, you know, I guess to play nice. I don't know why you need to play nice, but. See, now, now you're telling on yourself uh -oh. because you're mad at OU fans for doing exactly what you want to be done. You see? Yeah. Yes. But see, here's the thing is I at least admit that I'm like still butthurt about Jim, or I, and I hate the word butter, by the way, I just outed myself. I hate that term, but here we are. My thing is like, if, you know, and I, I had this question asked to me, and this is a very fair question. And it, it was from a, a sane OU fan on Twitter, which I loved. It's like, if Jimbo Fisher up and voluntarily left, which I know at OU hasn't happened since like the seventies. And I get that. That's huge. Like coaches don't voluntarily leave. If Jimbo Fisher left and went to, and I'm not going to say like a Texas or an OU because those are too close to AM, just like up and went to like Clemson. And, you know, how would I feel? Wouldn't I be mad? And I said, the difference between what is happening at A&M and what happened at OU, OU was winning. OU was in the college football playoff. OU was constantly in the national spotlight. And every time Lincoln Riley was up for either, you know, 
whether it was rumored or not, the Cowboys, whatever job, he stayed. So this would have been a huge shock. Jimbo has got the guys there. Can he put it on the field? Now, if he does that and then leaves, I'll be pissed. But let's not act like we're not mad about it, guys. I'm getting people on OU being like, we wanted him to leave. We think Venables is a way better coach. We're happy he left. I'm like, that's not, it might be true. Venables might be a better coach, but that's not what happened last year. And that didn't happen all season. Is it, is the culture talk coming, Ted? I feel like the culture well, talk's coming. No, I, I honestly believe, and I don't know, I guess one of the things is, and maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm somewhat insulated from a lot of like these Twitter wars. Like I don't you should, No, that's, stay that way. It'll that's keep not you the, staying. <laughs> yeah. That's not really what I end up doing, but from, from what I've gathered and what I see happening over and over is OU, well, USC will be picked to go to do like win the Pac-12 mm -hmm. and USC is on this great rise because of Caleb Williams and because of Lincoln Riley. And then OU is picked by a bunch of people. And, and you got to remember back in the spring, there was people picking OU like fifth, sixth, in the big 12 and you know like seven and five type of team and what has pissed OU fans off is that everyone thinks that when Lincoln Riley left like Oklahoma is some sinking ship and I would say Gabe could correct me on this 95 percent of people are probably happier now with Brent Venables and the way that he's is running and will run the program than Lincoln Riley. Now, Lincoln Riley for five years has had no bad press, zero. And then this last season finally started to happen. People were finally talking about the way the program was being run. They were having culture issues. You know, some of the same things were happening over and over. And he's gone. And it's frustrating to people that, we actually really like our coach. We actually love the direction of our program. And they get offended whenever USC, Lincoln Riley leaves. And no one talks about the things that went wrong with Lincoln at Oklahoma. And anytime someone brings up Venables and what Oklahoma is going to do now, it's like, well, you know, Lincoln and Caleb Williams are gone. Do you not guys aren't going to be any good. I feel like that's more of the, debate or the anger thing than anything am i wrong gabe i i think that that's got a lot to do with it mm -hmm. i i think there's a there's a lot of things that factored in casey yeah clearly ou fans were hurt when lincoln left the way that he did i know i was right the night before you know i do the radio call we do the radio call for ou and the night before we we get the first post-game interview with him and says he tell, tells us he's not going anywhere oh yeah oh i remember it well <laughs> and then set doubles down on it again in, in the press conference setting and so we're so i wake up sunday morning i'm like what the hell so it, there was that part of it but it is i ted i think you're right it's like people think all of a sudden oh you're just not going to be good now and it, it's like oh you wasn't good before lincoln was the head coach and we, we, we've been doing this, you know, so now it's, it's more of a like, OU versus the world type mentality with the fan base. This is the most fired up I've seen this fan base in a long time. So all this stuff is actually, it's working in OU's favor. And also Venables is, I mean, he's just a demanding dude. And he's using all of that to motivate these kids. And Jerry Schmidt came back from Texas A&M. It's just, all this stuff is is kind of coming together for this program to actually take it to another level because, in my opinion, it had plateaued, mm -hmm. right? It was at that level where really, really, really good. Big 12 champs, what, six years in a row. But like you mentioned, we got to the playoff, and I was on the field for that Orange Bowl against Bama, and I was on the field for the Peach Bowl uh, against LSU. It wasn't close, man, so – Hopefully we're thinking, Hey, we saw the level that Lincoln Riley could take this thing to. And it wasn't good enough for a lot of people around here. So we think Venables is that guy. So that's why, that's why OU fans are so fired up. 
and I, I think that's great, you know, and I know it's the, the cliche, you know, the, the material that players need, you know, it's kind of the, the chalkboard material. And I think that for, for fans, that totally makes sense. And like you said, it's so true. And as, as the honorary OU bandwagoner in the office, yeah. it's always like, you know, you, you always have a guy that's either going to win the Heisman or is in the conversation for the Heisman. You're getting to the playoff. You're winning the Big 12. The Red River rivalry, I wanted to say shootout, but I know I'm not supposed to. All those things, like, that was always a huge storyline when Lincoln was there. When he left, understandably, you would be hurt. And like you said, everyone believed he was saying because he said it. He said it to you guys. He said it nationally. There was no indication that he was going to leave. I think that there's two things that are happening here. And that's where I think that I like to argue so much back with this fan base right now, because you can't find anywhere where I said, oh, is not going to be any good. My thing is, is I think OU fans are still very hurt that Lincoln did the way he did. And you've got Caleb Williams and his dad and everything that's going on with that. And also, oh, you should be very excited because Venables is one of the best coordinators we've seen in a long time. He's a tough guy. He's at home. All those things, both of them can exist just like I can have an opinion on OU and a and can also stink. Those two things can also <laughs> exist. So, you know, that's, that's where I have so much fun with all of this. And that's why I love talking to guys like you about it, because, you know, as a person who just covers college football nationally, I look and I say, you know, yeah, it sucks that OU lost so much and it sucks that they were a part of the big drama in the off season and Caleb Williams left and, you know, the transfer portal was a mess. They didn't get some like schmuck off the street. They got somebody really good in the big 12 where, you know, Texas is back question mark. Like, I don't know why that's all of a sudden a huge thing again, but it's like, Oh, you is not falling off the cliff just because Lincoln Riley left. But a lot of OU fans that I mix up on social media with, it's like, if you bring up Lincoln Riley, you basically kick their dog under the table. And so that's why I keep doing it because it's like, Hey guys, if you actually listen to my opinion on Oklahoma, the team, it's a lot different than the way you're handling Lincoln Riley. And I do think USC is going to be very good. The PAC 12 just isn't that great as a whole, but it's also fun to mix it up. You know, that that's kind of where I'm at. So it's kind of outing myself a little bit, but just own it. I'd be furious about Lincoln Riley, but own that Brent Venables is a really, really good coach. And maybe your fan base does as a whole. They just don't do it on Twitter very often. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I, I was never furious. I was never really? upset, especially you, whenever I, a, a piece of information that's probably important. Please, Brent Venables has gone on record saying Teddy is the his favorite player he's ever coached. Well, so, I mean, to say there's, I've got a slight amount of bias built in. Okay, I, mean, a I, mean, I was going to say I know you you have played for the guy, and so I get it. But if you're the favorite child, of course you're not going to be mad that dad's coming home. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I had I had a bunch of problems with a lot of the things that Lincoln Riley did whenever he was here. Gotcha. Um, you know, and there's a, there's more bias built into that because I'm a defensive guy mm -hmm. and Lincoln Riley was offensive guy. But um, I don't I don't know. It's here's the thing that everyone probably wants to know okay. from you. All right. Who wins a championship first, USC or Oklahoma? Well, here's my caveat. And this I like to do this a lot. Sometimes Brandon on Unnecessary Roughness calls me caveat Smith for a reason. <laughs> is Oklahoma staying in the Big 12 in this scenario or is Oklahoma in the SEC? Because if Oklahoma is going to the SEC and the playoff stays the way that it is with four teams right now, unfortunately for OU fans, I apologize with all due respect. I'm going to have to put USC there just because getting to the playoff, being one of those four spots right now in the SEC is much harder than in the Pac-12. If they were to stay in the Big 12, I would say OU. Uh, but moving from... You know, and again, I don't know how the pods are going to work in the divisions, but the SEC is tough, fellas. You know that. And right now, Oklahoma is the king of the Big 12, as well they should be. You move into a conference with Alabama and you Georgia, LSU, you go down the list, it's a lot tougher. It's helped a and though, right? Well, I hope it's up to a and you know? I mean, no, of course not. I hate – I you talking about oh, you no, going I, to the – No, I'm saying it's, it's – moving to the SEC has helped Texas A&M as a program. Oh, as a program, yes. Now, the, you know, it depends on who you ask. If you ask your fan base, they're going to say no because, you know, we don't win anything still. Um, but from a standpoint of, of recruiting, absolutely. And granted, the state of Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and that whole area, they're always going to be able to recruit well just because there's a million dudes at all times. 
but the money, the visibility, the facilities. I mean, I'm sure you guys had been to AM's facilities before the SEC move and after the SEC move. It's just not even close. But then the issue now becomes if you do bring in Texas and you do bring OU, that evens the SEC recruiting field. So I do think that there's going to be a lot of different factors that go into it, but it's helped AM for sure from a visibility standpoint. Also, a guy named Johnny Manziel helps that a lot just because the in, entrance into the conference Good just time. happened to be that year, you know, casually, no big deal. Um, but OU has proven that they're a national name no matter what, over and over and over. It's definitely going to help them. Just the competition level from what we've seen in recent years in the SEC from top to bottom is more difficult. That's not to say OU can't be successful, but I do think that OU fans, Texas fans, they're excited for the move, just like AM fans were and Missouri fans were back in 2011. Going to play those, those teams every single week is a lot different than going to play Kansas. And that's just a fact. Yeah. The, Unless you're playing Vanderbilt, then it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> the, the, the interesting part about it is what does that college football playoff expansion look like? Right? That's, that's the important part because you're right. Life's going to be a lot tougher for OU and the SEC. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. But if, if the SEC is getting two, three teams in, mm. confident OU can be one of the top three teams on, on a regular, you know, uh, we'll see how frequent of a basis. It's going, to be, it's going to be a different world. But, yeah, I think that, that CFP expansion has, has a lot to do with it. Now, as an A&M grad, and we're the same age, so what – how different is it like in the sec like, as a fan for you like how, how much how big of a of a change was that for you when they went from the big 12 to the sec and had that initial success and really haven't done much since like yeah, was it, it. Okay. was it weird <laughs> um it was weird because you know i grew up going to the same places you know all my friends you know, we were going to Austin, we were going to Lubbock, we were going to Stillwater, we were going to Norman. And those were the games, you know, especially in high school and college that we loved going to. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, we're not going to any of those places anymore. We're going to go to Columbia, South Carolina. We're going to go to Gainesville. Like just from a location standpoint, it was weird. I think that the feeling in especially, you know, I mean, and I, I saw people bringing this up, you know, the, the feeling of the 77 to zero game from, I will never live that down. The, all of those bad memories of playing OU, playing Texas. I cried my eyes out on Thanksgiving every single year. That was just what I did. It was a weird feeling to go into a conference for most, you know, most of these teams, there's not a lot of history with. So the idea of having like the rivalry with LSU on Thanksgiving, like I can't fake that hate. I can't fake the hate for LSU like I had for Texas growing up. I can't fake the feeling of getting, you know, our asses kicked 77 to zero by one of our rival teams, you know, playing South Carolina or playing Florida. So that was the biggest change for me, which is having to kind of curate this passion that I'd grown up with. And then also just the national relevance, all of a sudden having a spotlight on a and because of the initial success. Now they won the Cotton Bowl that year okay, fine, whatever, not being able to take that next step for the last 10 years, that's the same feeling as I had growing up in the Big 12 because we didn't do that either. So that's very familiar. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the, the Texas game. I, I've all, we make fun of this at Oklahoma because when you view it from afar, it's like, it's almost like um, watching two like teenagers act like they're going to fight and it never happens. Yeah. So I, who's to blame for the Texas and Texas A&M rivalry that it doesn't happen anymore because it's really fun to watch from afar. Like, Oh yeah, you guys want to play. We'll play, but it never <laughs> happened. It's so funny. It's very childish. You're right. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Um, so this is another one of those things that people, you know, whether whatever side you're on, no one wants to admit, but from my understanding and from talking to people inside both programs, it's gone back and forth whose fault it is. You know, A&M initially made the move and at the time A&M still wanted to play Texas. Texas said, no, if you're going to leave, we're, you know, we're going to take our ball and go home. Fine. Originally that was what happened. Then however many years later, a and M then comes and says, okay, we're established a little bit in the SEC. You know, we're, we're here now. We've made our money. We want to put together, which I think is one of the best rivalries in college football, back together. 
Texas then says no, or then A&M then says no. So it's this whole, it's this back and forth of who said it when, but it seems like both sides have said, we want to play. And the other side says, no, no one wants to be the instigator. It feels like that actually agrees with the other school. So when Texas wants to play, a and is going to say no. When a and wants to play, Texas is going to say no. And round and round we go. And at this point, I'm like, guys, let's just play. Let's just play. We had the pettiness. We said yes. They said no. They said yes. We said no. It's a you know, back and forth breakup. I'm sick of this whole Twitter back and forth you know, what school matters more, like, let's get back on the field and play. And I feel the same way about OU. And Gabe, you mentioned earlier, you know, it's going to be a lot harder going into the SEC for OU. Well, it's going to be a lot harder for teams in the SEC to deal with OU and with Texas. You know, it's not just like these two schools are coming in with no history and no competition. Like, this is going to be tough for every single school that has to play each other, including Texas A&M then having to go back and playing Texas and OU. So I'm so sick of the fighting. It's like, we're going to fight about recruits. You know, when Arch Manning signed with Texas, congratulations, you got him. I didn't like talk any type of crap at all. I was like, congratulations. Let's see if he pans out until we play each other on the field. We're not going to know who's better. We can talk all this crap all we want. It's just like, come on, let's stop being children. And I, I have to ask you too, because I know that this is now going to be a thing. And, our, you know, I don't know, I'm assuming not your friend, Mike Gundy, you know, kind of came out and did the same thing. And my immediate reaction is, I know how this feels. This is the blueprint. This happened to us in 2010. A&M decides, you know, hey, in 2012, we're going to go to the SEC. Texas says, screw you guys. Oklahoma says, we're going to go to the SEC in 2024. Oklahoma State says, screw you guys. And eventually those things will flip just like they did with AM in Texas. And it's like, who makes them play the government? I don't know. TV networks. Yeah. Money. That's what we're hoping for is that when the big, cause the big 12s media rights deal is up here soon, they're going to have to renegotiate it. We're hoping that the TV networks tell Brett, your mark and the big 12, like, no, 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 you're making Oklahoma state play bedlam. That's what we're hoping for. Because unless that happens, you're right. It sounds like it's going to be exactly like Texas and Texas A&M, and it's going to be ridiculous. And Stupid. we have we have openly lobbied for Bedlam <laughs> to remain on here. Well, you should. First of all, without Bedlam, and I mean, I know that, you know, I live in a, in a gambling is legal state, you know, we're a gambling company. Everly really over. Ban- I mean, Bedlam is one of my favorite games to bet on, including the Red River rivalry, by the way. I mean, that's another one. Those are the two. Without Bedlam, what? how are gamblers going to survive on, on rivalry weekend? I, I don't know. Just... Like, and again, like Texas and OU going to the SEC together, like part my gambling brain is like, thank God, we'll still be able to get that game. But, you know, to me, these rivalries that if you're a college football fan, no matter if you have, a, you know, any attachment to these schools, these games mean so much as a whole. And then you look at the states. I think that any in-state rivals, regardless of what conference they're in, should always play. Like, there's just no doubt. That's, that is what makes it so fun. That's why growing up, like I said, being an Aggie fan as a kid was really hard, you know, in the just Ricky Williams days. I mean, again, Ricky Williams haunts my dreams, but it was just like, as a kid, those were, those memories matter. And also the money involved and with the way this sport has been going and is going, there's too much money not to be had to let these egos decide this. But I'm telling you guys, and you know, it, you've seen it up close. If somebody doesn't step in, whether it's a TV network or I don't, you know, Boone Pickens ghost, I have no idea. Somebody needs to step in because if not, it's going to be A&M in Texas part two. And it's just not fun. Like just play and shut up. Let's just settle it on the field. I still think it's going to happen. I, and I know everyone's, well, you saw, heard what Mike Gundy said. I don't take <laughs> what Mike Gundy says really to mean a whole lot. You want to talk about bias? Mike Gundy's like two and 15 against Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for Oklahoma, like things would be a whole lot different for Oklahoma state and where they sit. Um, So I I think that's him like really lobbying to not play that game because I mean, for them, I I think they got a great chance whenever Oklahoma and Texas are gone, like they could, they could run the, the big 12. And if it's still considered a power five or however you want to classify it, you win that conference, you got a good shot at making the playoffs. So definitely damn straight. He doesn't want to play that game. There's <laughs> See, no way. And that is, that is the big difference. I think when you look at the scenarios with what happened 10 years ago and what could happen with you guys is because, you know, everyone saw Texas 
and AM as Texas is the big brother, which is another phrase I just can't stand big brother, little brother. And I know you guys have that going on in Oklahoma as well. But AM kind of left the powerhouse, right? You know, the Longhorn Network, everything that every school in the Big 12 has had to deal with with Texas. And AM said, no, 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 we're not dealing with this. Where you guys in this scenario, you guys are in charge of this. You know, Oklahoma State is, and I, again, all with all due respect to Oklahoma State fans, in that scenario, the little brother. So it's like, oh, you is leaving. And Oklahoma State says, wait, we don't have to deal with the big bad brother anymore. Let's keep, let's not play. AM didn't have that same feeling because Texas does own that rivalry for most, the most part in football. Um, but at the same time, it's like, Mike Gundy, you don't get to decide that. And that's what I hope for OU and Oklahoma State fans is that you guys don't do the petty games that Texas and AM fans did and say you don't want to play. Deep down, everybody wants to play. I convinced myself I didn't want to play Texas anymore. And I was lying to myself. I do that a lot. I lied to myself completely. I want that game back and I want it on Thanksgiving. Whether that'll happen or not in the SEC, we'll see. But that was one of my favorite parts about the SEC move for Texas and OU was we're going to, they have to play each other no matter who has the bigger ego there. Yeah. Okay. So Casey, we, we had some people send in some questions. Oh boy. Yeah, I, I can only I, imagine. <laughs> I saw you, I saw you mixing it up with some of them on Twitter. Uh, I, you this, know, sometimes I get bored. That's what I'm saying. We need the season to start. You know, sometimes my phone won't, I won't even check my notifications for days at a time. And sometimes I just sit around. And I'm like, who can I fight with right now? So I can only imagine what they've got for me. Can't completely understand. This one's actually good. This one comes from rusty on Twitter who says, can we get the Barstool College Football Show to the Cotton Bowl for OU Texas? So this is this is a, a hard truth that I have to tell you guys. You have to talk about getting gambling legal down there. That's the whole issue right now. Is that since you know before we partnered with Penn National Gaming, we could go wherever we wanted, and technically we still can. The problem is, is that now we like to go to gambling states because we can gamble while we're there, and we can push the sports book. We have actually talked in the past about, about going to that game just because it is so much fun. Um, but as of right now, the only games that we do are in gambling states. So we could surprise. We don't know. But as of right now, I mean, we got to get the gambling legal. And I might be pissing people off. I don't know. But no. I'm, nope. I'm all about we it. We agree. It's frustrating. I thought whenever that ruling came down, I thought it was going to be like dominoes across I the country. I did too. But I don't know. It's crazy. And we've got. Like it's been really slow going here in Oklahoma. I, I think they're finally starting to get the ball rolling a little bit, but you know, cause we've, we've had the casino thing going for quite some time. I thought it was going to yeah. be pretty quick here, but nope. It's so bizarre to me. And I mean, not to go down a huge gambling hole, but it's like, you know, living in New York, I live in the city and until it was legal just pretty recently, you know, I could literally take uh, the train that took 10 minutes and go place my bets in New Jersey. And it's like all of that money is going to New Jersey. Why are we doing this? In Texas, it's like people can go to Louisiana and you're looking at just how much people love sports down there. It's like, why not go ahead and legalize it at the at the College World Series, which, you know, by the way, OU fans like to rub it in that AM lost. It's like, guys, you didn't win the whole thing, but that's a whole different, whole different story. But it's like I was staying across the river in Council Bluffs and was at a Barstool sports book and we could take a 10 minute Uber to Omaha to watch the game, but I could gamble on one side of the river. It's like, why are we not legal everywhere? Because people are losing money drastically to other states. And it's like Texas and Oklahoma need to speed it up so I can come back and do those games every once in a while. Yeah. The state of Oklahoma, we need to be taking these stupid gamblers money. Right. <laughs> They're going not, other places, not other places. <laughs> No, I hear you. Um, no, I, we've, we're, we are presented by Riverwind Casino. So oh, we are. Okay, good. You know, I, I have to be careful sometimes who no, I no, no. start pushing gambling, like just to, you know, to cover my bases. And I've also, and I, I don't know, I should have asked you this before. I have to be very proud of myself. I haven't sworn on the podcast, which in Barstool is like a different language. So I, I went out of my way. We don't, we don't like to tell our guests anything. Right. If they cuss and we usually adjust to the cussing levels, like we've had some where we start cussing at the start and it's a free for all. But I was like, I'm just going to see how she handles it. And yeah, I was stunned because I listened to your podcast quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I was you know, filterless. it's hard to throw the filter back on. So it is. Okay. So it is, but I think that like when I was working, uh, I worked for Texags, you know, right out of school. And then I worked for ESPN and then NBC. So for so long, I had that like 
all right, you know, it's got to be professional. I can't say anything wrong. And then when I got to Barstool, that all went away. But then I was scared of getting people in trouble. That's what it always was. was I was like, I know that if on ESPN, if I dropped all the F-bombs that I do, that I do at Barstool, somebody's going to get in trouble. So I didn't want to get you guys in trouble. So it's more a, a filter out of respect, I would say. But I'm sorry that you do listen to that, Gabe. It's a, <laughs> boy, do we let it fly on that show. <laughs> You, you definitely let it fly. Uh, there, there's no doubt about it, but you coming on here and not cussing is absolutely I bullshit. Crap. I, I said bullshit, crap, okay? Casey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said crap. I was like, bah, look at me. I'm not going to give him any shit. I said crap. Okay. She said crap. And I almost, I was laughing in my head. <laughs> like what happened to this girl? No, it was, I was truly like, if I say something I'm not supposed to, am I going to get them in trouble? I'm glad that I'm not. So you. at the end of the day, I meant to say shit, you know, no shit. They want to play each other. All right. <laughs> there you go. Okay. This last one, this last question for you comes from Ben Seiler on Twitter. And this is interesting. He said, what is going to happen to A&M's recruiting when OU and Texas join the SEC? It's going to get tougher. It's definitely going to get tougher. I mean, that's, you know, a no shit moment. Now that I can hit the shit button, it's a no shit moment. Um, you know, I think that and recruiting for AM, Texas and OU is always going to be great. And I know AM right now, again, no matter how much NIL money they shelled out, I don't care, you know, with the number one overall recruiting class. I think that whenever you can go to Austin, College Station and Norman, which are all right there next to each other for the most part, and you can say you are always going to be playing Alabama now, you're always going to be playing the likes of Georgia, Tennessee, and you go down the list, it makes it a lot harder because you can now recruit guys to College Station even though it's college station, you know, a lot of people and, and Norman's the same way where it's like a true college town. You're going to say, you're going to be playing against guys that plays for Nick Saban. You're going to be playing all over the country. Um, now you can do that, whether you're in Austin, Norman or college station, I think that's going to be big, but also it goes down to, and I, I, I don't know where this is all going to go. And I know as former players, everybody has completely different opinions. This NIL money is going to change recruiting so drastically every single year that the SEC is going to be a second tier to me about how recruiting happens. I think it's going to be NIL money. It's going to be who is willing to spend the most money regardless of what conference you're in. You know, I think you're going to see random schools popping out of nowhere because you've got a guy with a billion dollars saying, I don't care. I'll give him, you know, I'll give $20 million to the pool. That's going to be the more interesting thing to me with those three schools is a and Texas, and OU, who's going to be able to pony up the most money and who's willing to. And I think all three will. And I want all three to that. Again, I like it. Spend all the money in the world. I can only speak for myself. If that's going to get you to win and it's legal now, they were doing it before, allegedly. Anyways, now that it's legal, put it on the table and make Nick Saban fight for it. That's why I love the Jimbo thing. It's like Nick Saban's always able to get the best guys. Now everybody's going to have that same playing field with money, at least. Here's the, here's the, the downside like the upside is you got the number one recruiting class in the country the downside is Jimbo Fisher just put a lot of pressure on himself you know whenever you recruit like that you got the number one class and if it doesn't turn into conference championships college football playoff appearances the questions are going to start coming fast and furious and they should and they and they absolutely should and that's the self-awareness is key folks that's what I you know that that is so true because if you have everything, like we've mentioned, and it's not just AM, it's AM right now because they, they haven't been there. But if you have everything in the world at your fingertips and you can't get it to translate on the field to championships, then what are we doing here? What's the point? So the expectations are high and they should be, and there should be a fire under his ass because if you get the number one overall recruiting class and you did or did not pay millions of dollars for it, I don't know, whatever and you can't do anything with it, then that's this job is not working. So one can only hope because I can't stand these Twitter arguments. Well, hey, Aggie, what have you done? Nothing. We haven't done shit. I know that. Keep it moving, okay? I'm not talking about a and at this point. <laughs> oh, okay. Before we let you get out of here, any, any last message you want to send to your new favorite Twitter followers, the OU <sighs> Twitter people, any, any last words for, for our – loyal, insane <laughs> OU Twitter people that we love so much? Yes. Well, first of all, if you aren't passionate about your team, then you're not a fun fan base. So congratulations. You're a great fan base and a fun fan base. I will say, I don't want you to stop getting mad at me when I talk about Lincoln Riley because it's fun. And I think that one of the best storylines this year will be the very quiet 
USC versus OU from the outside looking in. I like the idea that we're going to be paying attention to USC because of OU and vice versa. But the message of the fan base would be just because I think it's funny that you cry about Lincoln Riley does not mean that I think your team stinks. In fact, I think Brent, Brent Vittles is a very good coach. I think that Dylan Gabriel is great. I just think it's funny that Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams left you guys. I'm sorry. I, I, it's hateful. I know two things can exist, folks. And AM doesn't matter in this argument, point blank. You should just set an alarm on your phone and like <laughs> every 10 to 12 days, just randomly post, oh, you have to get over Lincoln Riley. And oh, just say that and just let it go. You know what? And when I do that, I'm going to be like, Teddy told me so. <laughs> what it, what te and what's and, and what's funny that you mentioned that is because I don't even have the password to our like social media accounts for our podcast, our producing team does, but they also like to rile it up. Every single time Lincoln Riley is tweeted from that account. Now it's like, well, Casey must have the password today. And I'm like, well, oh, I boy. actually don't know it, but I might start doing it just for fun. I might ask for the password just to tweet out Lincoln Riley. So thank you, Teddy. I'll just keep them riled up for you. I love it. Casey, we appreciate you coming. So I, much fun, guys. I, I think I would, I think we were supposed to like call you an asshole and yell at you. We didn't <laughs> do that. I think that's what people wanted us to do. But oh, no, definitely. Definitely. You, I saw that. I saw that because I've never won a butt kiss award. Apparently, I can't be on the podcast and, you, you know, know, all anything. sorts of things. You don't know you, anything. You know nothing. No, nothing. Nothing at all. But, um, no, I mean, I'm glad you guys didn't call me an asshole. I will be, will be honest. I was looking forward to it because if you did call me, call me an asshole, I'm just going to call you guys assholes right back and say you're sexist because that's what Twitter does, right? That's true. You could have played that card quick and that would have gotten never, really awkward. Never. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome, Casey. Thank you. Have a great night. Well, that was probably a little more civilized than some people thought it was going to be. It, she was too good to be hard on. Like, what, what are you going to say? She was very reasonable. <laughs> very reasonable. <laughs> I thought she was going to come in guns hot. Yeah. Well, hey, um, I thought I thought she was excellent. I thought she hit on a bunch of good points. Um, that was just an all around fun interview. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, very uh, clearly. It, it's like she knows a lot about college football. That's why she's on a very, very <laughs> popular college football cast f podcast, and she hosts the college football show. Yeah. No, she uh, she does her stuff, man. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend but first it's time to get back out on the golf course people and there's nothing better to drink on the course than the number one seltzer in golf clubby seltzers clubby seltzers is an oklahoma company that is already winning national awards because their product is delicious it tastes exactly like a club special but it's a seltzer they're not just for the golf course either they're perfect to drink by the pool after mowing the lawn whatever if you haven't tried clubby seltzers yet go grab some you won't regret it. They also have the first variety pack out. To find a place near you that has clubbies, visit clubbyseltzers.com. I drank approximately 20 <laughs> raspberry <laughs> lemons this weekend. Nice. Oh, so good. So good. Attention business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Yeah, you do. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. A best-in-class business, I lost my place. Save huge amounts avoiding. of money. <laughs> yeah, there you go. By avoiding loss in the first place, Ted, great point. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. Are you looking to buy or sell a house in the OKC metro area? Use the Ronaldo Cloud Group. Stacia Ronaldo and Maddie Cloud are with Sage Sotheby's International Realty. They believe in prompt communication, an honest relationship, and luxury service. And that's exactly what they gave Gabe. They sold a house for Gabe. They found a house for Gabe's brother. They also found a house for Lane Johnson. We can't recommend them enough. You can reach them by calling or texting Stacia at 918 671 
6450 or you can contact them on instagram at sold by stacia and at sold by maddie underscore as always ted kick us off who do you have as your winner of the weekend well i thought about going with coach stoops xfl announced where their teams are going to be he's staying in arlington so uh they did ship coach stoops off to some hellhole like Orlando, Florida, or something crazy. He's staying in Arlington, Texas, close to home. But they did add three new venues, Vegas, Orlando, and San Antonio. So it's out. They've got their coaches matched up. We're going to see XFL back. It's going to be cool. I can't wait for that. Uh, It's going to be awesome. But I end up settling on Pete Rose. He's going to be back on the field there in Philly for the first time in over 30 years. Uh, They're going to be celebrating the 1981 uh, uh, World Series, and he had the lifetime ban in 1989. He's 81 years old. Uh, Did I say 1980 World Series? He's 81, and uh, he's going to be able to get back out on the field there. That should be really interesting, and I wonder if it does anything for his Hall of Fame stuff. It is it time, right? And I know there are some baseball purists out there, and I get it. Bet on baseball, whatever. But the Baseball Hall of Fame doesn't have arguably the best hitter of all time and then arguably the best, I, and I don't think it's much of an argument, Barry Bonds is the best baseball player ever, and he's not in the Hall of Fame. I, I don't know why they just don't put him in there and. You know, everyone knows the story. Right. I just, it's dumb to me. And if they don't know the story, guess where they can learn about it? In the Hall of Fame. You've got to expose everyone to the best and sometimes some some bad stories as well. It's a part of the game. You can't hide it. The dude is unbelievable. Um, I say put him in. I know there's people that, that say no, but. I think it's dumb, personally. Yeah, the Barry Bonds I, one, like for me, is just like totally crazy. I, I think I saw, I think this was the right, the correct stat. It was that if you if you turned every one of Barry Bonds' home runs into an out, he would still have a better OPS than David Ortiz, <laughs> <laughs> like wow. something like that. It was that's crazy. Yeah, I I I didn't. I don't think David Ortiz needed the ricochet ricochet shot there, but I think it was just trying to uh, trying to illuminate the fact that Barry Bonds was incredible. Here's the other thing with Bonds, and there's people that know a lot more about it than I do, but he never tested positive for steroids because they didn't test for steroids in Major League Baseball. So it's like. I don't know. It's so, it's so weird to me. And I know like there was, there was a lot of that went into the, uh, the steroid stuff that he was taking. I'm not sitting here trying to say that he didn't. I'm just saying that they didn't test for it during that time. It wasn't technically against the rules. So I, uh, I think it's ridiculous. I think the number one reason he's not in the hall of fame is because he was an asshole to a bunch of people. Yeah. I, I don't think he made very many friends with how he treated, especially remember baseball writers, are the ones that are voting. Yeah. Well, that's probably very true. And it's, uh, you can, you can say, well, that's what you get for being a jerk all those years, but you still got to have the, that story in the hall of fame in this guy's opinion. I, I agree. All right, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? <laughs> I had to go with Devontae Adams because as soon as you make a comparison between Derek Carr and, uh, oh, I don't know. I can't think of his name. He plays for the Green Bay Packers. Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers. Well, as soon as you make that comparison, uh, yeah. It just, it never is going to end well. And he's even said that 
as soon as he saw the comment written out, he was like, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. But he did clarify uh, because he said, what he said was like, when you go from hall, one Hall of Famer to another Hall of Famer, even then there's going to be an adjustment period. And everyone was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you saying Derek Carr's a Hall of Famer? Now he's not backing off of that statement, but uh, in no way was he trying to make a comparison between Aaron Rodgers and Derek Carr, but it's still funny to light that fuse and watch the whole world go crazy. Yeah. Any time it's, it reminds me and it's different, right? But when, when Tyree kill was like, yeah, two is yeah. more accurate than Mahomes. Like, wait, wait, hold on. What? Yeah. You've got you. I get, you're trying to like, you're trying to pump up your guy. Like he's your new guy. You got to develop that chemistry, but you can't go overboard with it. I that's fair, but I think it's important to remember that Devonte Adams and Derek Carr were college teammates. Yep. And boys, which is and crazy so, to think about those two at Fresno, man. Yeah. So clearly that, that relationship's been there for a long, long time. And yeah, he's fired up to play with this guy. He's probably fully aware that Aaron Rodgers is a little more accomplished has a has has a few more bullet points on the old resume but there's nothing wrong with with hyping up your guy hype him up and take the brunt of the criticism no big deal who cares yeah no i yep yeah, you got to do it you got to do it. watch watch Derek Carr come out and just slinging it this year yeah he's he's a good court he's he's done some really good things he's not always had the best team around him but like that's one of the differences though is Aaron Rodgers, like whenever you get to guys of that caliber, like there's a bunch, like if you're starting NFL quarterback, you're at a different level. But whenever you're a guy like Aaron Rodgers, I, you instantly make everyone else on the field better, like without a doubt. Like that's some of the best qualities of those really top tier guys is they make everyone around them better. And Devontae Adams is going to see some of that. Like some of those throws that Aaron Rodgers makes, whenever things have broken down or he's kind of just back backpedaling and just whips it. Like that's, that's a little bit different, but I still can't fault him for doing what he did. Yeah. Just hyping up his guy. It's huh. fine. All right. Let's get to my winner and loser. But first, first fidelity bank is a full service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFE. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFE donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you're doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. you got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. Its big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. Remember in 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the best in glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen, and became the first American distillery to win that competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon, at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconesdistilling.com. All right, for my winner of the weekend, I thought about going with Patrick Mahomes. I, you know, we talked about the Kyler Murray contract. He was asked about it, and he was asked about other quarterbacks making more money than him. And I just loved how he handled that question. Basically, he said, you know, when I signed my deal, I, I knew I was going to be set for life, regardless. 
and basically said, you know, I'm, I'm going to have made enough money. Like I, I'm really not worried about that. I'm trying to win Super Bowls. That's what I'm going to remember. And I just love that response. He was like, I'm good. Uh, I'm good with the amount of money I'm making on and off the field. Now it's all about winning for me. I thought that was, it was a really cool way to look at it. It is, but it's such a weird, it's such a weird thing that can you imagine as soon as someone signs a, like a contract, like the first thing is, Hey, what do you think that he makes more money than you? What do you think about that? It's such a weird thing to do, isn't it? It's yeah. Especially Mahomes. It's like Mahomes. I'm sure he's getting paid a fortune by Adidas bows, like all these yeah. endorsements he's got. And he's probably like, ah, man, it's, I mean, that's basically what he said. He's like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad I set the market for him. How about that? You know, yeah. I just, I'm glad they put a number out there for everyone to beat. And, and yeah, next time he's dynamic, he's going to continue to build on that answer. Cause next time he's about, yeah. And I'm taking a little less so that I can have better guys around me. You know, he's going to start adding that to it. So, so the, I, I took, I'm taking a little less moving forward so that they can take care of my guys. That'll play well in the locker room. He's either going to do that or he's going to delete his social media. Yeah, or he's going to scrub it, scrub and a it. renegotiation is going to happen. Uh-oh, Patrick Mahomes has scrubbed his Twitter account. Yeah. All right, but my winner of the weekend, the Cincinnati Bengals, man. Did you see those alternate helmets? It's pretty sweet, man. Oh, if you haven't seen them, go check them out. But so this year, the NFL is allowing teams to have an alternate helmet. So you can wear it for a couple games, but – the Bengals are going with white helmets with the black tiger stripes and they are so sick. And it, it really eliminates the number one reason I don't enjoy watching the Bengals play. The helmet's awesome. There's too much orange, man. There's yeah. just too much orange. And now I'm going to be able to stare at that beautiful white helmet. Oh, that, that thing is nasty. And speaking of nasty, whoever decided that the Bears alternate helmet should be orange needs to be fired immediately because that thing's disgusting. Why do you think they why do you think they did that? I I have no idea. No one likes their orange jerseys to begin. And no one says, oh, Chicago Bears. Yeah, let's let's incorporate more orange. No, the Bears, it's blue. The blue is the Bears. They kind of have. In, in their defense, a little bit. Orange accents. They don't have a good color. Like, you can't really build off of that really dark navy. There's not a whole lot you can do to change it up. And the I, only other thing that you have is that, that orange line in there. And it's way overboard. But I don't know what else you're going to do. But I'm definitely with you. I am I am not a fan of that helmet. It's terrible. Those those orange Chicago Bears helmets are gross. It's so bad that they may not ever wear them. <laughs> they, they said they're going to wear them on Thursday night football, and I still don't think it should be allowed. And I love the color rush games, right? I love yeah, it. I, I do too. I, I think they're great. I was part of the uh, Buffalo Bills, New York, New York Jets uh, colorblind game where people couldn't, it, the jerseys, we were wearing all red and the Jets were wearing all green and people that were red, green, colorblind just saw all gray and they were pissed. Yeah, that was, I mean, that's tough to, I didn't, I would never have thought about that either, but I love the color rush uniforms. I love the solid socks. There's nothing I hate more than wearing the half blue and half white or half red, half white, the socks in the NFL, they're disgraceful. The solid color socks make the whole uniform look a thousand times better. So most of them though, like just scroll through looking at all of them, like the, the, Eagles black helmet looks uh -huh. awesome. Well, you've got you got the Panthers, the Saints, and the Eagles. They're all doing black helmets as their alternate, and they're all sick. Mm -hmm. uh, it they're gonna look awesome. Hell, even the Texans red one, they're calling it like battle red or something like that. It pops pretty good, but the Bears orange, man, just a big miss. Big, big miss. Yeah, I love that the I love the Giants throwback uniforms too. I think they're so awesome and Patriots are doing their throwback uniform uh, with the, you know, the colonial guy playing center. 
pretty cool, but all in all, pretty good. The Bears missed massively <laughs> of yeah. all the teams. I mean, all the other ones are really cool. Like you, you mentioned, because there's kind of like two categories. There's alternates and then kind of the throwbacks. And the Cowboys are doing that white helmet throwback, which is always pretty cool. Uh, the Patriots, you mentioned that one. The Giants, the Falcons are bringing the red helmet back, which is so sick. Like some, it, it, and a lot of these are like elite looks. And then you've got Chicago where you just see it and you're like, oh, oh, gross. It's, it's awful. It's terrible. Maybe it's because yep. I was raised to despise the color orange, but I like to think I'm being, I'm being reasonable about this. It looks terrible. It looks terrible. And, it just it doesn't look anything like every everyone else is like you can see that it's a spin on what they do the it just looks nothing like the bears just flat out doesn't it look like the chicago bears yeah they someone's losing their job over that <laughs> it was a swing and a miss sorry sorry bears sorry bears fans which i don't have to say sorry to bears fans if there's anyone there's no one that's going to be more brutal about it than they are that's that's a good point yeah, it, maybe it will be self-corrected. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, for my loser of the weekend. Man, I hate to do this, but I thought about going with John Mechie. I mean, guys just had a rough go of it, mm-hmm. right? Uh, was one of the best receivers in all of college football. Tears his ACL last year in the SEC championship game. So you got the torn ACL. Not, not that big of a deal anymore, right? Still goes in the second round of the draft. Goes to the Texans, but just announced he'll likely miss his entire rookie year because he'll be going through treatment for leukemia. And that just, I mean, all the best to him, man, praying for that guy, but that's a rough go. The ACL, then leukemia combo, man, that's just, that's brutal. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Hopefully they got to it in time, got early, early detection, and uh, he's okay. Treatment goes well, but I'm with you. Yeah, so I also thought about going with the Boston Red Sox. They had they, they did not have a good weekend. And and the reason I bring it up is because I watched a little bit of their game on, on Friday. But so Sunday, they lost to the Toronto Blue Jays eight to four. So they lost all three games in the series. Uh, they lost Sunday eight to four. They lost Saturday four to one. But Friday was the game I caught a glimpse of where they lost 28 to five. They gave up 28 runs to the Blue Jays franchise record for the Blue Jays. Wow. What's that? That's 40 to 10 in three, in the three games outscored, not favorable 28 to five. What a brutal night. And I'm pretty sure the Blue Jays, they fired their manager not too long ago, like a couple of weeks ago. So it's not, I, I don't know, but it was 28 to five. That had to, and I don't care about Boston Red Sox fans at all, but that's, that's brutal. I'm I'm guessing they were probably in the seventh inning throwing like backup outfielders as pitchers like teams do these days. Yeah. But my, my loser of the weekend, Charles Leclerc, Ted, did you watch? I did not, unfortunately. Uh, I had my own uh, F1 race from Fort Gibson back to Goldsby, Oklahoma this morning. Nice. And I won I, it. I, won the <laughs> race. And, and you won it. Was this, was, were you the only participant in the race? I was the only participant, and somehow my power unit made it all the way from Fort Gibson to Goldsby, Oklahoma. No problems well, with the power unit. Well, Charles Leclerc, it, it actually wasn't the power unit this time. This was actually user air. And it was, he was super frustrated because it certainly looked like he had the best car there at the French Grand Prix. Started on pole, looked like he was cruising. But Ted, lap 18, just made a mistake, lost the rear, spun himself out into the tires, and his day was over. And, uh, I, I think, and I'm still back and forth on whether Leclerc's my guy or not. I, I think the fact that it's taking me this long is probably an indicator that he's not my guy. But I think my favorite thing in Formula One right now is Charles Leclerc yelling into his radio. 
I think that's my favorite thing. And this was definitely the loudest and angriest no that we've gotten from him. And it made it even better. And it was so, I, I think it was so passionate because he knew it was his fault and the car was performing well. That's where all the frustration was coming from. And even, he even said it in his post-race interview, uh, said it was his fault. And that if he keeps making mistakes like this, he doesn't deserve to win the championship. Ted, Charles Leclerc, not in a good place after this one. Yeah, if he keeps making mistakes like that, he'll be driving World of Outlaw here in, uh, in the Southeast United States before long. Oh, boy. I, it was an easy win for Max Verstappen. You'd be shocked to know that he won. Oh, yeah. How about that? Um, and it's like it's a three man race out there. And I will say, your boy Lewis Hamilton, P2, Ted, best finish of All the right. season for Mercedes, best finish of the season for Hamilton. There was, and he overcame some adversity, and I learned something. I don't know why. I didn't really ever think about whether the guys are drinking water in the car or not while they're racing. I, I know that. I understand that it's really tough on your body and like your heart rate rate is way up and it's really challenging physically and mentally and all that. I always, understood. I never really thought about them drinking water, but I read that he had a water bottle or he was, they called like a drinking bottle malfunction. And I was like, what do you mean? Like the straw didn't work. <laughs> what do you mean? A drinking bottle malfunction. Even like, up what? to formula one. Oh no. Lewis Hamil Hamilton's had a malfunction in his water dispensing unit. That's yeah, that's exactly how they should put it. But I, I honestly, I didn't know that was a thing. And I guess he well, doesn't normally drink water during races, but he tried during this one and nothing was coming out and it was malfunction. I was like, wait, you mean like the straw didn't work or how, how can a water bottle malfunction? What, what happened? Yeah. See, that's one of the good things about formula one is the races are pretty quick uh, unlike NASCAR. So you can afford to go ahead and push the fluids out there when you're stuck in that car for like, what seems like four hours, you don't want to drink too much. I mean, you want to stay hydrated, but there's a fine line. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't you don't. It, do you just pee in the suit? You just pee in the suit, right? You pee into the urine absorbing unit. <laughs> Some, some, now I'm, now I'm just imagining like <laughs> catheters and stuff. All right, we're done. This, th this, this episode's over <laughs> episode 234 in the books. We'll have a new podcast. that will drop Thursday morning. Just a reminder. You can hear Teddy from three to six on 94, seven, the ref. You can hear me on Sirius XM big 12 radio channel 375. Hope you all have a great week until next time. We appreciate y'all for listening and do what you always do. Oklahoma take care of each other.